So it uh, looks like the Bay Bridge closure had a big effect on attendance today. Hmm. <laughs> All right, so today we're going to finish talking about the replication fork and talk about four different problems. That is, the clamp can't get on. The solution is a clamp loader. Um, actually, both strands contain RNA, so it has to be removed either by polymerase 1 or ribonuclease H. The lagging strand is nicked. And so the NICs are sealed by DNA ligase. And the helicase introduces supercoils and covalent tangles. And those are taken care of by enzymes called topoisomerases. So last time we ended with this uh, wonderful video from the Stillman lab. And um, I'm just wondering if there are any questions that we didn't address last time. So one of the key things in the video is this three-way handoff right, of the primer from the primase to SSB to the clamp loader to the clamp and then to polymerase. And there was a question uh, about what controls the length of Okazaki fragments. So one of the ideas that came up in class was, hey, maybe it's the concentration of primer. Uh, excuse me, a primase, because if it's going off, on and off, if there's more, that should shorten, should shorten the, the Okazaki fragment length by increasing the frequency of priming, right? Because it'll be bound more. So as I mentioned, I, I said, I thought, I'm pretty sure that experiment's been done. And in fact, it has been done. But it was done in vitro in a biochemical assay in a test tube. And in the test tube, getting these uh, components together, it turns out that um, the concentration of primase does control the Okazaki fragment length. OK? So the more primase there is, the shorter the fragments. And the less primase there is, the fragments get longer. Now, that experiment turns out to never have been done in a cell. And the reason for that is what you can see here is the primase binds to the helicase. And it turns out the cell, a bacterial cell, is very sensitive to the amount of primase that's present. And the reason is that if there's too much primase, well, sorry, if there's not enough primase, you can't get DNA replication to go. That part's obvious. The question is, why can't you have two, what happens when you overexpress primase in a cell? And it turns out that what happens is primase binds to the helicase, and it prevents the helicase from ever getting on the DNA to start replication. That's a process that we'll talk about on Wednesday. And it comes from the fact that there's very little helicase in a cell, so if you have too much primase, it inhibits the loading of helicase to initiate DNA replication. But in vitro, at least, the concentration of primase controls fragment length. Yeah? Um, in the movie, it shows that when the clamp or the lagging strand, uh, when the lagging strand hits the previous Okazaki fragment, the clamp stays on the strand. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that there's a bunch of clamps on, on that lagging strand? Yeah, that's a really good question. So the the movie shows that the clamp doesn't come off the lagging strand at the end of synthesis. And that is actually true. It doesn't come off. And what it does there is it attracts Paul 1 to that site. Um, there is actually a fragment of clamp loader called the wrench. <laughs> and the wrench, so there's three subunits of clamp loader form the wrench. And that takes the clamps off in an ATP-independent reaction. So after that Okazaki fragment is done and sealed, you still have the problem that the clamps are, as you said, accumulating on, on the DNA. And it turns out that the clamp loader subunits are not made stoichiometrically in the cell. There's excess of a few of the subunits, and they form the complex a subcomplex that takes off clamps. No. So is that a reducible clamp then? 
Yes, the clamps are reused. It does it by binding the lock washer form. It stabilizes the lock washer form, and it just falls off. They're open already. Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this one. This one. This one, that's the lagging strand, right? So that's single strand there. And that's the double strand from the lagging strand. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, is there an optimal length of the lagging strand? So it's, it's different in different organisms. So in that sense, it can't be optimal. Like there's no biophysically optimal length that's controlled in, in different organisms by the concentration of presumably primase. But that's, as I said, not known in vivo. You sent me the email about, about that. Is that right? About the, the primase experiment? Oh, that was somebody else. Somebody sent me this great email, ha re having read two papers about the primase concentration. And all I can say is 20 points for Gryffindor. There was, <laughs> it was great. It was nice. Yeah. Um, it's in E. coli, right? E. coli. No. no. We'll come to that Wednesday. You guys are so far ahead, you know? People came to, to my office hours yesterday, and you were, people were asking questions about next week's lectures. <laughs> Same thing. Very nice. OK, so let's take a look at the clamp loader. Again, the clamp loader is one of these integrating components in DNA replication. It's called the gamma complex in bacteria and replication factor C in eukaryotes. It binds, obviously, the clamp. And it binds ATP, which um, uh, helps stabilize this open form of the, of the clamp. That binds also to the primer template in a way that I'll show you in a second. The question is, how, why is? Why is the clamp loader specific for the primer template? And um, once the primer template is recognized, there's the DNA or the primer template exerts an allosteric effect on the clamp loader, these five subunits, that cause ATP to be hydrolyzed and the clamp to be released at the correct location. Um, the crystal structure of the clamp loaders from both bacteria and eukaryotes were solved here at Berkeley by John Kurian's group. And here's a picture of um, the clamp loader from eukaryotes bound to proliferating cell nuclear antigen, right? The clamp uh, from a eukaryotic system. And what you see is that the hole in the clamp corresponds to actually a hole in this spiral of subunits. It's shown schematically here. <coughs> so based on the um, crystal structure of the uh, RFC bound to PCNA, what they notice is that the hole in the clamp is coaxial with the hole in the, these five subunits of RFC. And so they made this model um, <coughs> that the, the spiral of subunits, the five subunits in the clamp loader, actually matches the spiral in an A-form duplex. OK. So remember, DNA-RNA hybrids have 
A form structure, whereas DNA DNA more has more B form structure, and they have different backbone architectures. And so, based on <coughs> on this structure, they didn't. There was no DNA in the crystal, but they modeled DNA in the crystal in the following way: that you see the pri the primer template. So here's the primer, and here's the template. We're coming through this hole in the spiral, and they proposed. Korean's lab proposed that the specificity for the primer template came from the fact that it would be A-form and the spiral and the clamp loader would match that. That turned out to be wrong. <laughs> okay, And it was based on this model, which you will see, w w the feature that you see here is that the primer template goes all the way through the, through the spiral. Okay. So, right, and this is, this is essentially the same thing I just showed you. So, um, just uh, this year, Korean's lab managed to crystallize um, the clamp loader. This is now a bacterial gamma complex instead of a eukaryotic one with DNA present. So what I showed you before is a clamp loader plus clamp. This is the clamp loader plus DNA. And I'm sure all of you have already picked up on the fact that probably the next paper in uh, cell is going to be all three components together. But so far, it's just the combination, uh, two combinations of two. So this is a gamma complex bound to DNA published earlier this year. And <coughs> what they found was that the DNA, the, they, they crystallized it with a primer template, but in this case, it was all DNA. There's no RNA in this structure. And what they found was that the DNA does not go all the way through the clamp loader. In fact, the primer is buried at dead ends into one of the subunits of the clamp loader. And it's the template that snakes out. And so, and on top of that, all the DNA contacts are with the template strand. Okay, that's what's shown here, this yellow strand here. The other strand, the primer strand, doesn't make any contacts with, with the uh, clamp loader. So the idea that came out of this um, crystal structure is that the primer template is recognized because it's the only place that has this end with a single strand. And the fact that the contacts are made with the template strand allows either DNA RNA or DNA DNA helices to be accommodated in this, in this complex. And so the idea has changed from it's the A-form helix that specifies the binding of the clamp loader to the fact, the idea that the clamp loader is permissive for any kind of primer template. And it's probably something like SSB that is helping to localize the clamp loader. Yep. How does this model work for ligand transplants, where you don't have an end, you're starting in the middle of something? And for the, for the template, there isn't an end. It, has to, it makes sense for something, the DNA to go through because it's continuous. Um, so for ligand transplants, how does this model work? For lagging strand synthesis, the Primer is the RNA that's laid down by primase, and the single-stranded template is what cre it's created by helicase. Right, but there's no, there's no end. You, you follow the DNA one way, you go further on to lagging transcendence, and you follow the other way, you get helicase. There's no end for, the, for it to be buried inside. Or yeah, this is the end of the primer. But, the, the, but it binds the template, so that, the template that's, doesn't uh, have an end. Right. So this, so the question is, the template doesn't have an end. So it doesn't. The template snakes out, and the reason it doesn't continue beyond this is they didn't use a larger DNA. But oh. this channel is permissive. Oh, okay. All right. It should accommodate a continuous strand. Yeah, I wasn't clear about that. <clears throat> okay. So uh, bottom. This is more detailed than. I care about, but just wanted you to know what's new this year. Yep. So, clamp, 
the clamp loader binds the end of the double strand right. God, that's such a sim it's so much simpler than what I said. That's great. <laughs> Does it protect the RNA primer? Not that I'm aware of. Okay, so um, now we're starting to build up a much more complicated holoenzyme. Um, helicase binds the primase. It lays down the RNA primer. That attracts SSB, which attracts clamp loader. Clamp loader is actually one of the subunits of clamp loader is, is this tau subunit, or is uh, bound to the tau subunit. And that attracts the polymerase dimer um, at the place where the clamp is, is laid down on this, on this end, double-stranded end. So do we know if the two uh, polymerase subunits are oriented the same direction as it's illustrated here? Or if they are, if they are oriented opposite directions, then the DNA would not have to loop around? Right. Um, do we know that? So the, the idea is that they are oriented. We don't know that, but the, the notion is that they are, and that there is this trombone mo The current model is this trombone model, which would require that they be oriented the same direction. Um, right, and then as it was pointed out in the movie, when the Paul three reaches the primer of the previous fragment, um, this isn't quite true. It's actually the wrench that removes beta from the template after the nick is sealed. Uh, and then it cycles around again. OK, so I think that covers all, these, all the initial problems that we had dealt with. What's the, what's the dynamics of the holoenzyme itself? And, and in, in a second, after we take these questions, we're going to start talking about how other factors clean up after this, after this giant machine. Yeah, uh, so come to you. Sorry. Did Tau subunit hold the dimer, the polymerase three dimer together? Yes. So did the actual DNA stream move through the polymerases? Or mm -hmm. Because the polymerases don't move along the strand, they stay there. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what is the meaning of previous Okazaki fragment? And it's, it, it, it's exactly what you just said. It's the one that was made just before the one that's finishing. It's, it's literally, you know, th this guy is going to run into a double-stranded region that starts with RNA. And that actually sets up the next slide perfectly. There are other questions about this. Okay. So um, the lagging strand contains RNA, and in fact, the leading strand also contains RNA right at the beginning. And so, how is that? How are those RNAs removed? Um, remember, they have to be removed because they're the lo loci of errors, because primer is not, primase is not error correcting, and they're also chemically unstable. So they, if they were left in, in the DNA double helix, they would introduce nicks into the DNA because the backbone would be cleaved spontaneously. So there are two um, redundant functions that take out the RNA-DNA duplex. One of them is called ribonuclease H. It's a ribonuclease, ribon, ribonuclease, so nuclease, that means it cuts nucleic acids. Ribo means it cuts RNA, not not DNA. That would be, if it cut DNA, it would be deoxyribonuclease, right? So it's a ribonuclease. It cuts RNA, but it only does that, this one only does that if the RNA is bound to DNA, is paired with DNA. So ribonuclease H does not cut single-stranded RNA. It does not cut double-stranded RNA. It only cuts RNA strands that are paired with DNA strands. And that occurs in the cell 
at these primers for the Okazaki fragments. So ribonuclease H is one activity that would just chop up the RNA uh, in the Okazaki fragment, and that would, tend, that would leave a little gap, right? And Paul III could rip into that, could just fill in that gap and then fall off when it reaches the end. And then uh, alternatively, Paul I, DNA polymerase I, Remember we talked about it had three activities, the polymerase, the three to five exo, which is proofreading. And then it also has this five prime to three prime exo, which means it can cut either DNA or RNA ahead of it, ahead of, ahead of the site of synthesis. And when it does that, it has a, the property that it translates or moves NICs along the DNA. So polymerase one can uh, jump onto this primer, and the 5 prime to 3 prime exo cuts ahead, and the polymerase fills in behind. And the consequence of that activity is that th if there's a nick in the DNA, it just moves along the DNA. Polymerase 1 will do that for a while until it falls off. And so it'll cut off the RNA primer plus some of the DNA g that got made by Paul 3 but that's essentially the price that's paid to get rid of the RNA. Okay? Yeah. Right. So my question is, let's say they, they start from here, right? The polymerase is the one that connecting stuff from here and then do like that. But the, in here, they have to connect with the, the one that's already there, right? Mm -hmm. So, but then like if you look at it, the five prime of this guy is actually only monophosphate. Uh, mono uh -huh. It's not triphosphate anymore. Correct. So uh, yeah, so the question is, how are the NICs sealed? And that's the next slide, I think. Why don't you come up here? You can, you can give the lecture. <laughs> it's actually not the next slide, but just kidding. Um, oh, yeah, it is. Look at that. Okay. Other questions? Great. So now we have to seal the NIC. Great. OK, so this is not such a great slide. Uh, but um, uh, the, the, here's the problem, that there's a 5' prime monophosphate and a 3' prime hydroxyl. So there's no way for that 3' prime hydroxyl to attack the monophosphate and form a covalent bond. There's no leaving group on the 5' prime phosphate. So the the chemical problem of sealing the NIC is that the 5' prime phosphate has to be activated for chemical attack. That's the problem that's solved by this enzyme DNA ligase. How do you activate the 5' prime monophosphate? And <clears throat> that's basically done with an AMP donor. Okay, so this is the unifying idea about DNA ligase. What happens is um, shown right here in the middle of the slide that the 5' prime phosphate is activated by adding to it AMP. So here's the phosphate and this RA, that A is, uh, you know, an adenine base, rib ribo-A. Okay, so this is the key species in the ligase reaction. Somehow the 5' prime phosphate needs to be activated, so now it's a diphosphate, then AMP is a great leaving group. Does that, that make sense, right? So this hydroxyl now can attack that phosphate and the AMP leaves. That's going to solve the problem. So different DNA ligases use different sources of AMP. That's the only complicating aspect of this fundamentally really simple reaction. So where does the AMP come from? Well, some DNA ligases use ATP. That makes a whole lot of sense, right? So um, the way the enzyme works is there's a lysine. It's covalently attacking 
the alpha phosphate, pyrophosphate leaves, and then that lysine um, contributes or um, moves that AMP group to the 5' prime phosphate. So this, this hydroxyl attacks, and now you generate this reactive species. Okay, so that's, that part's really simple, and the products are pyrophosphate and AMP stuck on the 5' prime phosphate. Great. There are some DNA ligases, though, that don't use AMP, ATP as the source of AMP. Instead, they use NAD. It's nic nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Okay, which I cleverly didn't put on the slide. Okay, so NAD, one of the, it's a dinucleotide and one of the nucleotide units is AMP. And that's shown here. There's a pyrophosphate in the middle of it. Here's the AMP. Here's the nicotinamide part. And instead of using ATP, this lysine attacks the phosphate, and the nicotinamide phosphate leaves. And, and that loads AMP onto the enzyme, which then donates it to the 5' um, to the 5' prime phosphate. And after that, everything's the same. The enzyme just catalyzes attack of the 3' prime hydroxyl onto the 5' prime phosphate, and that seals the NIC. Okay, so this, all this, part, this is really simple, and this is the hard part, getting to this reactive intermediate on the enzyme. Right, and so this is an absolutely crucial reaction in DNA replication in the cell, but the discovery of this enzyme essentially launched a million ships. And what I mean by that is that the, having access to this enzyme allowed you and me to actually splice together pieces of DNA that came from wherever. So DNA ligase, yes, it performs a really critical reaction in the cell. But in terms of its impact, for humanity, what's much more important is that it allowed people to do DNA cloning. And it's an example of why people have studied DNA replication so, um, so actively, because many of the enzymes have biotechnological or biotech applications in addition to having fundamental providing fundamental insights into cellular processes. Yeah? Does this allow for interspecies So the question is, does it allow for interspecies DNA splicing? And certainly in the test tube, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So the question is, what's driving the reaction? Because you have, in DNA replication, part of what's driving it is the pyrophosphate hydrolysis. So certainly when ATP is used, you get about 7 kcals per mole for the breakage of this bond. And then you get another 7 kcals per mole for the hydrolysis of the pyrophosphate. When NAD is used, actually, you just get 7 kcals per mole. So it's, that's still enough to drive this reaction. It's a, it's a hu you know, that you, you're hitting a double instead of a home run. Or it's a home run, but it's not in the bay, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. So when primate puts on the RNA primer, the very first substrate it uses is a uh, ribonucleotide triphosphate. Yes. It puts on, but when it put, in the process of putting it on, it is no longer, it becomes a monophosphate? No, it's still a triphosphate. So the question was, when primase puts on, starts the primer, does it use a ribonucleotide triphosphate? The answer is yes. And so then, is the 5' prime RNA, is that a triphosphate? But it's gone from this product, right? DNA ligase does not ligate 
the 3 prime hydroxyl to an RNA. The RNA is already cleaved out and the gap is filled in. So there's no triphosphate there. That's, okay. the, that's the problem that has to be solved. Oh, by this point, it's been replaced with a DNA, a DNA monophosphate? It's, this DNA monophosphate uh, here came from translating the NIC through where the primer was. Uh, so the NIC is moved by? By Paul 1. Okay. Or it could, yeah. 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 Yeah, this is the product that's produced right here in the middle of the slide. Three prime hydroxyl literally right next to a five prime phosphate from the next nucleotide in in the chain, but there's no covalent bond between them. So at this point the genome is nicked every thousand base pairs or so without ligase. Yeah. But isn't the primer like Yeah. Paul one fills in the gap. Yeah. So um before Paul one like uh three uh three prime spots, there's a triphosphate at the end, right? And then a and then a DNA. Like right after the Sadaki triangle is formed. Is there something that keeps the DNA, the three prime hydroxyl the DNA? It's not spontaneous, right. You need an enzyme to catalyze that, and there is no enzyme in the cell. Yes? So when the RNA removes the RNA fragment? Yeah. So, so if the RNAs has removed the primer before Paul 3 got there, does Paul 3 go through? And yes, it does. But you still end up with a nick, and usually that's made 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 absolutely flush by Paul 1 flush means no gap so after Paul 3 is done usually Paul 1 gets on there and translates the nick so make sure that there's no gap yeah Great question. Great question. So, so what happens in the mutant? God, this is great. What happens in the mutant? Help me out. What happens in the mutant? What happens in the Paul 1 mutant? Remember Paul 1 mutant? Way, God, I can't even remember that lecture. I don't know how you remember it. Jeez. It was discovered that Paul 1 was not the replicative polymerase by making a mutant that knocks it out, and the cell's still alive. So how, what activities are redundant to Paul 1? RNA's H plus Paul 3. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Um, it's also possible that if there are they're nicks like that, that Paul 4 or Paul 5 might jump in. <laughs> Paul 2. Yeah. But, I mean, in terms of the framework that we've discussed, you could see how, Paul, how RNA's age plus Paul 3 would be redundant. Yeah. Okay, so just to summarize, the, 
the, yeah. So this strand has RNA in it. Here's the NIC. There's a three prime hydroxyl next to a five prime phosphate, like that's a uracil. And that gets taken out by the RNAs H or Pol1. And that gets translated. And then the NIC gets sealed. So the U gets replaced by T. OK, so now we have a problem. The last problem we're going to talk about for 15 minutes is the fact that the helicase creates uh, tangles and sup what are called supercoils. And at the end of DNA replication, the two circular pieces of DNA actually wind around each other. So they're linked like a chain, covalently linked. And so how do you ever separate the DNA strands? And to illustrate what supercoils are, I'm going to need a volunteer from the audience. Oh, you guys sit in the front row. I need somebody, somebody else. <clears throat> Don't worry, I'm not going to hit you with this. This is like, God, after all this, after five lectures, the trust level is so low in this room. <laughs> Oh my God. <clears throat> Please. All right. We have a sucker, I mean a volunteer from the, <laughs> from the, from the back. OK, great. So you're going to be, this is the double-stranded duplex, right? So we have to make it right, a right-handed right super uh, double helix. So go ahead. You, you make it right-handed. Yep. It's, see, the strands are going like that. OK. So make it right-handed. Keep, keep going. So this is just the DNA template ahead. OK, that's good. What do you think? That's good? Is that OK? Your insurance is paid up, I presume? <laughs> All right. So what does a helicase do? It's going to un unwind it, right? You ready? Sure. You better hold on. OK. Is it going to do it fat, slow, or fast? <laughs> OK. Look what happened. These are supercoils in the DNA. And remember, we're making, you know, if it's 500 nucleotides a second or 1,000 nucleotides a second, we're unwinding 100 duplex coils. And that creates this mess in front that now the polymerase can't get through that. Thank you very much. Let's have a hand for the volunteer. <laughs> OK, so that's where we are. Now we have this problem that we have supercoils in the DNA. <clears throat> and that those supercoils get um, created any time the uh, covalently closed duplex you know, is, op is opened up. As long as you get rid of double helical turns, you, those, hel those turns are preserved by creating supercoils ahead or behind of, of what's moving. So this shows RNA polymerase creating supercoils. What we've just talked about is helicase making supercoils in front. And what that is is the double helix. So each of these, this line is a double helix. So it's not two strands of DNA winding around each other. This is actually four strands of DNA winding around each other in this diagram. So you create these supercoils. And at the end of replication, as I said, you create these um, links. And the, the technical word for these links is called catenanes. They're called catenanes. OK, so every time you unwind it, a double helical turn, you create one positive supercoil. It's absolutely, these are absolutely coupled uh, events. And if you don't get, if the cell doesn't get rid of those, <coughs> the uh, polymerase machines are stopped, and the chromosome can break. And when the chromosome breaks, the cells can die. Or if, this, if the catenanes are not resolved, then, of course, the DNA strands can't be separated from each other. They're physically linked. They're covalently linked. So one daughter cell doesn't get DNA, and the mother cell keeps two copies of the DNA. And eventually, that's curtains. OK. So 
This, the supercoils and catenanes are an example of what's called DNA topology. It's literally the writhe of the DNA around itself. That's what topology means. We're not changing the covalent structure of DNA by changing its topology. We're just changing its arrangement in space. Okay. And here are some examples of, of topological problems that need to be resolved by topoisomerases um, to manage the replication and readout of DNA. So all of these problems, these supercoils, get resolved into relaxed, relaxed DNA. That is the standard double-stranded DNA that we think of by topoisomerases. Yeah. So the, qu the question about the slider, minus and plus are direct a direction or is it charge? So it's not charge. It's literally the hand of the supercoil. So each of these lines is a double helix. And you can see that the minus supercoil is right-handed and the plus supercoil is left-handed. If you put your thumb in the direction of, of, the, of, of the whole supercoil, then <coughs> Um, right, this, these DNA double helices wrap around each other like the fingers of your left hand, whereas this has the opposite hand. <laughs> okay, so the, the idea is that <coughs> Um, topoisomerases get rid of these topological problems that are created by replication and that makes the topoisomerases major therapeutic targets. I was just at a meeting in Oxford just before class started um, in, in August and there were actually two talks, oh not today, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was actually at Hogwarts, and that's how I got here. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so there were actually two talks on targeting topoisomerases with new antibacterial enzymes, uh, um, new, new uh, antibacterial therapeutics. But um, in, in us, uh, cancer represents uh, cell division and uh, uncontrolled cell division, and so the human topoisomerases are um, therapeutic targets for anti-cancer agents. And here's the, the key reaction that you have the supercoil and the DNA is actually split and the strands are passed through each other. And that's, we're going to talk mostly about topo, I, topo 2s because they're actually essential, they're the major therapeutic targets because without topo2 the cell is dead. And I'll tell you what topo2s are in a second. So that's the next slide. So there are two kinds of topoisomerases and the, the nomenclature is really awful. But the major categories of topoisomerases are topoisomerase 1 and topoisomerase 2. Topoisomerase 1 means that they cut one strand or nick one strand, whereas topoisomerase 2 enzymes cut both strands and pass the other duplex through the gap. And <coughs> topoisomerase 1 enzymes are broken into two subclasses. The obvious one is they just nick the strand and then the other strand swivels around. But the non that's uh, one, <coughs> one B enzymes. Topoisomerase 1A enzymes actually go to uh, kind of an open duplex region like this. They cut, completely cut one strand and pass the other strand through. And, and that um, changes, um, changes the topology by one turn at a time. Yeah. Oh, God. Same guys. <laughs> Can you guys get together ahead of time and ask one question? <laughs> <laughs> so if topo 2 is the only essential one, does that mean it, it can also do topo 1's job? So the question is, does topo 2 do topo 1's job? The answer is not exactly. Um, topo 2, I didn't 
I didn't mean to imply that. It's just that topo2 is the only one that can resolve catenanes because it actually cuts both strands and passes them through each other. And so we're going to talk about topo2. That's the last thing I'm going to say about topo1. OK, so the magic, the central magic of topo2 is that it manages to cut DNA and never let go of the ends. Never, ever, ever, ever lets go of the ends. And, and how, is that hap how does that happen? It turns out its uh, catalytic subunit is a dimer that has two tyrosine hydroxyls that attack the phosphate backbone on, on uh, complementary strands. And then that breaks both strands with this little stagger. And then in order to pass one duplex through the other, those covalently bound DNA strands now are moved 20 angstroms apart, because that's how big the DNA duplex is. So you have to make a big gate. You have to open a big hole for the other duplex to pass through. And the reason that the topoisomerase never lets go is that it's holding on with covalent bonds that turn out to be made reversibly. Okay. And they're only reversed when the DNA is put back together. The TOPO2 enzymes um, are called TOPO2s in eukaryotes and gyrase enzymes in prokaryotes. They have similar structures from eukaryotes and prokaryotes. This is the work of James Berger's lab here at Berkeley. Seychelles is working on our thesis on this family of enzymes. So do you want to come up and finish this? OK. So let, let, me, let me just make a few points here. Um, maybe they'll take care of your question. So basically, it's um, the gyre B dimer is binding onto a gyre A dimer. And the key to the mechanism is that there are two gates in the enzyme that allow DNA to pass through. OK, so <clears throat> first of all, this bottom part is the gyre A, this top part is gyre B. And the idea is that the strand that's going to be broken is bound here at sort of the base of the first gate, or in the first gate. <coughs> OK, so that's binding. And then <coughs> with ATP binding, the segment that is going to be transferred, the T segment, that's called the transfer segment. G is for the gate segment. The gate segment binds first, and then you have ATP and the T segment binding in. And that closes this upper gate. So now the topoisomerase um, is, is gripped so the DNA can't be released. Um, <coughs> the T segment is cleaved by those tyrosines, and the DNA there's a conformational change here. You can see the, in this diagram the, the gyre A subunit has spread apart. That's opening the gate, 20 angstroms. And this T segment passes through into this lower chamber. And it, then the top closes back up. And the, then there's this gate at the bottom. The second gate opens up, and the T segment passes all the way through. At that point, the, uh, n the gap is sealed, and ADP is released. And you're back to here. Okay. So there are two gates, one here and one here. And that's shown in a movie here. The gyre B subunit isn't shown. This is the G segment, or gate segment. And this is the T segment, which is binding up here and then passing through. And then that opens up. A really cool experiment, for example, that showed that, that, that this is the mechanism was uh, James Berger J uh, actually introduced a disulfide bond into this gate right here that would only form if the gate was closed. So the disulfide bond is a covalent bond, right? So it can never open up in the absence of reducing agents. So with a disulfide bond formed here, uh, Berger showed that, in fact, this is what was trapped. And it was only after they added reducing agents could they get 
the DNA released. And that was one of the key experiments that showed that the DNA, this T-segment DNA, actually passes through the enzyme. Isn't that, that's like the coolest thing, that, that first of all, it's passing through the DNA, but this enzyme, topoisomerase II enzymes from all of us, all, back, all living things, are built so that something as huge as DNA, this 20 angstrom thing, can pass through the enzyme and do it efficiently. Okay, so I hear in the distance the pealing bells of 11 o'clock, but I just, we have gotten to the end here, and I just want to make two quick points um, to summarize these, um, these, uh, these processes that we've talked about so far. Uh, basically, it's a coordinated process. The key is the clamp loader, which um, binds this tau subunit, which binds to the two uh, polymerases. Um, the integrating uh, parts of this machine are SSB, which obviously binds DNA. It also binds the primase, and it binds the clamp loader. The clamp loader, uh, sorry, the clamp is also an integrating element, this donut, because it binds DNA, the clamp loader, and also the polymerases that hold it on, a and, and hold on the polymerase. So that's what makes this whole process uh, processive. The key problem that we haven't talked about yet is how the helicase gets on in the first place, and, and that's going to be the fun that we have on Wednesday.